Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we work now through the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. We are in starting from Palmanach section number 14 out of 19 which tells us that our journey is now coming to an end with our final six sections. And it is interesting that with section number 14 we do begin to kind of get the sense that Whitman knows that he's bringing this really long poem down to its final conclusion. Now I say really long poem, nothing close to what we're going to see in our study of Song of Myself. I've said that we're using starting from Pomenok as a way to prepare ourselves to read all of the 52 sections of, uh, of Song of Myself. And as we prepare to do that, let's pay attention here in this section to the ways in which Whitman is, this is going to sound strange to you guys at first, but I want you to think about this. The ways in which Whitman in this passage, in this section of Starting from Pomenoc, tries to in some way rediscover, uh, I, I guess you would say rediscover or reinvent maybe, the great taxonomer Aristotle. Now, of course, we've had a lot to say about Aristotle in other lectures at LearnStrong.net. We've had a lot to say about the previous poems of Leaves of Grass at LearnStrong.net. Here we're going to meet Whitman as politician and the great lover of America, and we're going to play this, this out in some really powerful ways. We're going to see the birth, the genesis in many ways, of the great Woody Guthrie's text, This Land is Our Land, the 1940 offering that became such a famous song. I've already mentioned LearnStrong.net, and my assumptions are that you've already worked with us through the inscriptions, 24 lectures and the poems of, the tw of inscriptions, as well as the introductory, introductory comments of starting from Pomenoc and then the, the past 13 sections. It is kind of important that if you're going to read passage 14 here, you have to have a sense of what came before in, start, in terms of starting from Pomenon. Now, we're going to be paying attention to, uh, write this down already at 2B, lots and lots of repetitions. I'm telling you in advance, take a look at it and number them yourselves just to see if we're getting close to the correct number. Land will be repeated 25 times. The word O oh will be repeated four times. The word yet will be repeated 10 times. And then I, I want you to try and count up how many states and how many different places are being referenced in this uh, section. It is the longest section, by the way, of all of the 19 of starting from Pomenoc. Um, count up number of, of exclamation points. And this will be fascinating. There's 45 of these exclamation points in this section. And we'll you know, not point them out as we read necessarily uh, all of them, but where do they end and why do they end and where they end? Those are the kinds of 2B types of questions that I want you, that I want you to uh, begin to think about. Um, let's turn now, and, and again, like I normally like to do, I like to read the entire section and then come back to exegete, but it's just so long that we're going to have to pick up right away with the end of 13 and the beginning of 14. You'll remember the end of 13 was whoever you are, how superb and how divine is your body or any part of it with an exclamation point to set us up for the exclamation point that will finish the first line of 14. We'll come back to this, whoever you are. Again, in passage 13, it was somebody that began the set of lines and ended with whoever you are, and now we're back to whoever you are again. There's this certain kind of intimacy. We'll see this per, uh, personal is the way that he uses the word at the end of 14. Whoever you are, to you, endless announcements. Now this information about announcements we have to point out, and of course the exclamation point to finish it. Whitman is in some ways joining together Aristotle as the great taxonomer, that great creator of hierarchies. Of course we talk about it in our biology courses, right? But, and our study of course in here of poetics and the ways in which he talks about what makes a great, a, a great tragedy, in Oedipus Rex especially. But notice the word announcements is also bringing that idea of journalism, where Whitman spent so much of his life in journalism. In other words, I want to make an announcement or a proclamation, and this is going to be, in many ways, the kind of first of a number of these kind of cataloging, listing types of poetic lines. Now, we've seen some of this already, obviously, uh, early on in Links of Grass, but here we're really going to be introduced to it. So let's go through it now together. Notice he calls it Daughter uh, of the Lands. Did you wait for your poet? Now, the, the language throughout Lisa Grass is interestingly sexualized 
but can be easily refuted as, if somebody were to say, well, this is very sexual language, he could easily say, oh, come on, I'm not speaking literally, obviously, I'm speaking metaphorically. What's wrong with you about, you know, tongues and breasts and breastplates and chests and all of that? We'll get to it later in our study of Song of Myself. We're going to see some similar kinds of things here. What is going on with all these repeated O's? What's going on with all these exclamation points? Is this sexual in some kind of way? Well, as we pointed out already in earlier lectures, Whitman dances between the risque and the commonplace, and we'll, we'll play the game here. Daughter of the lands, by the way, notice the use of the word land or lands will happen again and again. We're gonna have at least 25 times that he's gonna, he's gonna reference this whole thing of the land. Daughter of the lands, did you wait for your poet? Notice the intimacy of the word your, right? And this notion of waiting, like Whitman, as we said in earlier lectures, it's like Whitman believes that for a very long time, the world has been waiting for this amazing thing called America, and of course democracy, and America is the fruition. Again, we've talked about this so many times already. Did you wait, notice the second, uh, the second question, did you wait for one with a flowing mouth and indicative hand? Now, again, the language can be obviously read as sexual. It can be read as, uh, you know, like a river is flowing. Obviously, it ties to a whole lot of stuff that we said from passage 13 and even earlier, starting from Pomenach. Toward the male of the states, toward the female of the states, again, this need to bring together both sides, male and female, exalting, it's a key word in Leaves of Grass, words, words to democracy's lands. And the moment we see words stacked together like that, we think, of course, of, of Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet, words, 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 right? Notice that democracy is one of those three essentials that we studied about in passage 10 of starting from Pomenach. Remember, it's love, democracy, and religion. This will be the celebration of democracy. Although really what it's going to be a celebration of more than anything is physically the land that is America. Now, we think about America today and we talk about America today as a geographic entity or as an idea if you're, if you're Bono, right? But the reality is that when Whitman's writing these poems, a lot of people in the world still didn't think about America as a land yet, right? Now, obviously today it's thought of this way, in, in large measure because of lines like the ones we're about to study. Notice he says, interlinked. That is to say, the lands, the democratic lands, are all connected. He's constantly playing this game of the connectivity. Food yielding, and again we pointed out how he loves to create these one word from two words kind of thing with a hyphen food yielding lands and of course it was true in Whitman's day it's true today that so much of the food of the world is grown in our country and and he wants to celebrate that then notice we're going to begin with 13 natural resources that are going to be emphasized land of coal and iron by the way notice all the exclamation points land of gold land of cotton sugar rice land of wheat beef pork land of wool and hemp interestingly land of the apple and the grape. Now in some ways Whitman of course is playing around with a very ancient biblical idea of the promised land, a land of flowing with milk and honey as we'll read about it in the, in the uh, Christian Old Testament. We're playing obviously around with the idea that America is not just a city on the hill but is rather a land that is a land of great great resources and great values and he starts of course with those kind of natural resources. From there, we then go to the geography of the physical country itself. He's obviously trying to capture the huge sweep that is America, land of the pastoral plains. Think about pastoral as it relates to our study of the Romantics. The grass fields of the world, and it's interesting, he, he creates that term, grass fields, as two words hyphenated, right? And of the world uh, makes us think about later when we study our Passage to India poem, from uh, Leaves of Grass. Obviously, as well, Ian Forrester's classic novel, Passage to India. Land of those sweet-aired, and he uses the alighted uh, verb for air, sweet-aired, interminable plateaus, right? That is to say, endless. They, I, he's trying to capture the sweet, the endlessness of, of the land. Land of the herd, the garden, the healthy house of adobe. Interesting spelling, by the way, of adobe. Just to point out, um, Song of Myself, line 323, will play the same spelling. It's kind of his own invention. He liked to play that game. He figured if Shakespeare could do it, he could do it. Lands where the northwest Columbia winds, where the southwest Colorado winds. Obviously, he's a great lover of rivers, and, and uh, we're going to get to more of them here in a second. Land of the eastern Chesapeake, 
land of the Delaware. He, these are native. These are native tribe names that he's going to be celebrating here. We're going to get back to this real complicated dance that Whitman will play with the native peoples of America. He's acutely aware that there were native peoples who were here when a whole lot of other people from Europe showed up. And the ways in which that tension is a disturbing one and obviously an exhilarating one for him as well. I mean, they go, it cuts both ways, right? Notice he'll continue here with Chesapeake Land of the Delaware, Land of Ontario, Erie, Huron, Michigan, obviously the Great Lakes. Land of the thir the old thirteen, as he will call them. What, I mean, notice they're both capitalized, the old and thirteen. Massachusetts land, land of Vermont and Connecticut, land of the ocean shores. Now he's going to back away from New England, and he's going to and he's going to begin to mess around with the geography of the land. Uh, well, here are these lines, and we got to think about dry salvages. The river is within us. The sea is all about us. I'm talking now. T. S. Eliot's Four Cortez. Um, uh, the, the, the land is the, uh, the, the sea is the land, and it's also the beaches into which it reaches, the, 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 all of that. It, it's all right here, watch, in, in, all of this, in all of this stuff. Land of the ocean shores, land of Sierras and Peaks. Obviously, Woody Guthrie's 1940, this land is your land, this land is our land, uh, it, it is born really in some ways right here. Land of boatmen and sailors, again, thinking of dry salvages, fishermen's land inexorable lands. That is to say, again, this idea that it's we can't you can never get to the end of it, right? The clutched together, and again the alighted word clutch. This is interesting, the passionate ones. Again, this is interesting the way he'll use sexual language in, in really interesting ways. How can land make love and hold on to each other in passionate ways? It's fascinating. He'll play the same game of dalliance of eagles when we'll mess around with that one later. The side by side, and here, uh, I mean, th this is a classic example of the way Whitman loves to play games with well read readers. The side by side, of course, immediately takes us to the Adam and Eve account of sexuality in Milton's Paradise Lost. Go back and look at our lectures at LearnStrong.net, uh, specifically on that information. The side by side, the elder and the younger brothers, the bony limbed, he'll, he'll, he'll love to talk about the idea of. Uh, of the physique as being significant. Bodhi lived, obviously, again, he's creating these one words from two words, and then again, you saw the alighted limbed, right? The great women's land, he's wanting to be inclusive in his language, the feminine, and then he does something very interesting. Is this sexual language? The experienced sisters and the inexperienced sisters, and notice he uses the word sisters here, again, coming out of his Quaker background. Fair, or, or far breed land, more alighted verbs here, Arctic braced, Mexican breeze, the diverse, that's key, the compact, all somehow held together even though it's quite diverse. The Pennsylvanian, the Virginian, the double Carolinian, of all, uh, and, and, then, and then he'll go with this word, oh, oh, all and each well loved by me, my intrepid, fearless, right, nations. Oh, again, another oh. I at any rate include you all with perfect love. So he'll use the word love, <clears throat> as we have said, one of his big three essentials. He'll use the word love, notice not capitalized here. He'll use the word love, and you begin to wonder, I mean, he's, he, he's kind of dancing around with some sexual language here, and of course the repetition of oh, 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 we'll hear it over again. He says, I cannot be discharged from you. Now that's interesting. Is it sexual language? Is he talking about somehow sexually? Or is he talking about, I cannot be thrown out? Uh, uh, not from one any sooner than another. In other words, I love, I love you all. Oh, death. And by this exclamation point, we've hit 45 exclamation marks in this amount of reading. It's an amazing thing. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that he's going to try and do this and pull it off. Some people will say overdoes it. But then he stops. And for the rest of the poem, we have no exclamation points left. Why? It's interesting questions. We'd love to be able to interview him to ask. One more, oh, oh, for all that. And then he begins uh, uh, now to move on to the end of the poem. I am yet of you unseen this hour with irrepressible love. And again, from, ir from inextricable, from interminable to inextricable to irrepressible. He loves these words that, he lo that, that will speak specifically to the ways in which it's translinguistic. I can't speak about the love that I have. Then he goes back to walking metaphors. Instead, now it's not Alabama, as we saw in an earlier poem. And we immediately think about not just Passage 11, but as well Song of Myself. Walking New England, a friend. Now there's uh, 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 of course, uh, here later it's going to be neighbor. This is central to our reading of, of uh, Leaves of Grass. I have students that will say, when I sit down and read Leaves of Grass, there's something intimate about Leaves of Grass that is not like any other text we read together. It's quite remarkable. Of course, let's put it in our notes. 
The moment we think about walking with friends or needing help walking along, we're obviously to our Dante as pilgrim and his guide Virgil, right? A traveler, by the way, in the 1891, this word was spelled with two L's in, in the manuscript, which is interesting. I'll let you run that one down. Think about Song of Myself as well, passage 46, when we get there, the great traveler, the great walker, right? Splashing my bare feet in the edge of the summer ripples on Pominox sand. Now, it's interesting, like, uh, the, the things he says, notice bare feet, it's quite, it's, it's quite interesting, he would say this. And notice how little Pominox gets mentioned in the actual poem starting from Pominox, and here it is, right? Crossing the prairies... Uh, and, and this word, this idea of crossing is, is important, the idea that we're trying to scan everything. Crossing the prairies, dwelling again in Chicago. Now that's interesting that he uses the word again, and in Chicago. Was he ever in Chicago? And to what degree did, is he going to mention only one city in this entire list of America? And it's the city of Chicago. Sandberg, of course, will pick up on it in his classic text. We've treated that one at Bernstrom.net. Dwelling in every town, observing, notice all these ING words. Dwelling in every town, observing shows, births, improvements, structures, arts. Notice there's five of them there, right? Listening to orators and oratresses in public halls, of and through the states as during life, each man and woman, my neighbor. Now we go from friend to neighbor, right? The Louisianian, um, and again, we're going we're gonna to remind ourselves that he did travel at least in 1848 to New Orleans. The Georgian is near to me as I near to him and her. Obviously, we're going south now in the southern states. The Mississippi and the Arkansan, yet with me, and I yet with any of them. Notice the repetition of yet as it started early on. Uh, o oh death, O oh, for all that I am yet. And then now here we are with all these repetitions of yet. I yet with any of them, yet upon the plains west of the Spinal River. Now there is, and notice he doesn't, he doesn't hyphenate this one. The Spinal River? Is he talking about the Mississippi or is he talking about the, the, talking about the Missouri River? Of course, the Missouri River at uh, 2341 uh, miles, uh, 2,341 miles, is a little bit longer than the Mississippi at 2,318 uh, miles. But notice how he comments on how that river is the Spinal River. He most likely is talking about the Mississippi here when he talks about this. This was the river that he knew as he went down to New Orleans and he was just kind of blown away, as of course Mark Twain will be as well by the fact that that river does and is so much the symbol of America. Yet, more of these yets, returning eastward, yet in the seaside state, of course, Connecticut here, or in Maryland, yet Canadian, and again, this uh, we, we'll see this in journeys through the states from inscriptions. Um, again, he, he will travel to Canada in 1880. He loves the spelling of Canadian with the K, and that's how he does it through leaves of grass. Notice what he says about the Canadians. Cheerily braving the winter, the snow and ice, welcome to me. Now, of course, yeah, those of us who live in Canada or those of us who live in the cold, in the cold regions know, yeah, most of the time when it's really wretched cold, we're not like, you know, cheerily braving it, right? Yet a true son, either of Maine or the Granite State, obviously New York, or the uh, Narragansett Bay, obviously Rhode Island, or the Empire State, New York, yet sailing to other shores, to annex the same, this is interesting, are we talking about colonizing here? Yet welcoming every new brother, hereby applying these leaves, interesting he uses this word leaves here now as leaves of grass, to the new ones from the hour they unite with the old ones. Now notice we could be talking about the new poems or new sections of poems he's talking about here, or he could be talking about the leaves of states and the harmony that he's, that he's hoping for. Coming among the new ones, myself, we'll get to myself with Song of Myself, to be their companion and equal, we've gone from friend to neighbor to companion and equal, coming personally to you now, and again the word personal is so powerful, right? In joining, and, and again, notice the word coming here as the first word right in the epigraph of Leaves of Grass, and we see the word coming over and over again, right? In joining you to Acts 1, characters 2, spectacles 3, with me, like Virgil obviously being led by Dante. That is to say, Whitman does it all in a poem like this. Let's jump quickly at 2A. Well, obviously, America is vast and a majestic country. At 2B, we mentioned all the repetitions. They're amazing. At 3A, we mentioned Aristotle as the great taxonomer, the great lister. Obviously, Dante's Divine Comedy, Woody Guthrie's uh, 1940, This Land is Your Land. 
I also would like to point out uh, Pushkin's uh, prophet and go and take a look at what we have to say about that as being a powerful example of the way in which a poet can become that really kind of effulgent type of really powerful and inspired artist. Finally, at 3B, what are your thoughts about this great land of, uh, of America? I mean, do you think of it as a great land? And if you do, what part of it is so great physically, the geography of it all, right? What are your feelings about as well all these lists? And do they work for you? And what about this personal Whitman? Come back to passage 15 and we'll play more around with this personal Whitman and the ways in which that's quite a remarkable thing as well. Thank you.